Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for uh, our our final uh, installment of the History Speaker Series for the first part of 2023. Um, we are taking a little summer hiatus after this. So thank you for joining us. And happy National Indigenous Peoples Day as well. Um, so we have a very special presenter with us tonight and a presentation I'm very much looking forward to. Um, but first, I have a, a few matters of business to attend to before we get going. Um, so firstly, I want to thank Marianne Grant, uh, Trish Crogrand, and the OMA History Committee for making this presentation possible, and this whole series possible, to be honest. Um, thank you to Deanne, our partner over at Rogers TV, who uh, publishes these on Rogers TV afterwards and makes us look so good and professional. Um, thank you to McKenna, who is running the Zoom tonight. Um, and uh, thank you to our speaker, of course, as well, who I will get to momentarily. So the order of things tonight, if you've never joined us before, uh, is um, we will have our presentation and then that will be followed up by a Q&A. So if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A function, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will pose as many of those as time allows to Mike at the end of the presentation. Um, and now without further ado, it is my honor to be able to introduce our speaker for the evening. Uh, so mm. Mike Hill is joining us today. Mike is a former history teacher. Um, and Mike has also written a for a number of newspapers and magazines, including a weekly column for the Toronto Star. Um, Mike's latest book is The Lost Prime Ministers. But we are here to talk about uh, your 2017 book, The Mariposa Folk Festival, A History, which my notes tell me uh, is referred to as uh, the definitive book on the history of the festival. Mike is referred to as the unofficial historian of the Mariposa Folk Festival. And uh, you've been volunteering since 2000, but later the artistic director of the festival uh, beginning in 2006. Um, and what's really interesting is I see that um, you interviewed Gordon Lightfoot for the book as well. So we can learn a little bit more about a really his own Gordon Lightfoot for uh, through reading your story. Um, with the festival coming up so soon in the year, um, I think it's very fitting that you you end off our spring season of uh, the History Speaker Series. So, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you to all of you in the audience for joining us. And uh, that's it for me for now. Mike, take it away. Thanks, Lindsay. And thanks to Oma for, um, you know, for <laughs> inviting me to do this. And uh, and thanks to the people who have, you know, shown enough interest to actually tune in. Um, you know, I, I want to start off by uh, saying that, uh, you know, Aurelia has a uh, a really rich uh, cultural history. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, I, I've got a picture of just four important uh, parts of that. Uh, Gordon Lightfoot, of course, who uh, I think many of us consider him the greatest songwriter in Canadian history. Um, uh, fr uh, Franklin Carmichael uh, is considered by a lot of art experts as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, watercolor painter um, in Canadian history and, and a, a the youngest member of the group of seven. And then uh, Arthur Schilling, local Rama boy, um, he, uh, he's probably considered one of the greatest Indigenous artists in Canadian history and died tragically too young, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, some of his work hangs with the group of seven down at Kleinberg. And then there's Stephen Leacock, of course, who, uh, you know, his, uh, legacy is his humor, um, sunshine sketches. He, he called Aurelia Mariposa and, uh, you know, we know where that name is, has gone and, uh, his memory is still being kept alive at the museum and also, um, with the, uh, the annual medal for humor. So, um, there's another uh, factor there too. The the uh, something else that Aurelia is known for, and this is something probably people in Aurelia don't even realize, but the Mariposa Folk Festival is known coast to coast and internationally, and it started in Aurelia as well. And it apparently was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> Back in 1961, 
there was a man named uh, John Fraser who was uh, a um, he was a radio personality known as Mr. Canada. And he was going around to small towns all across the country and trying to tell people in the towns how to um, how to encourage um, uh, tourism. And he used the uh, the Shakespeare Festival in Stratford as his uh, as his example, of course. And um, Ruth uh, Jones was uh, in the audience that night and she. Um, uh, she was a real folk music fan and folk music, you know, this would be hard for young people to believe, but folk music was arguably the most popular music at the time. Bob Dylan was starting out, Joan Baez, Peter, Paul and Mary, um, very, very popular. And there was one folk festival in North America, and that was down at Newport, Rhode Island. And Ruth thought, well, maybe we could do that in Canada and more specifically in Aurelia. Um, I've included a picture here on, on the right of uh, the path and uh, people in Aurelia uh, of a certain age uh, remember the path and that's where the meeting was actually where they where uh, this idea was uh, was first uh, originated. Uh, Ruth quickly uh, got her husband involved. Uh, his name is Dr. Casey Jones and uh, he uh, he put up the money. Ruth did the organizing and most of the legwork, but she brought in uh, people like Pete McGarvey. Pete was uh, uh, an alderman at the time and uh, a broadcaster at uh, local radio station CFOR. And then they eventually got several other people, uh, Sid Dolgay from The Travelers, uh, David Major, who was uh, Ruth's brother, Ian Tyson, who was just becoming famous as a singer, and uh, several other people that uh, you may have run across at, at other times. Uh, in the space of seven months, in early 1961, uh, Ruth and her uh, and her gang, they were able to pull together a, a festival, and and it, it was um, quite an accomplishment, you know, to start from scratch and to to have it actually uh, come about as it did. Uh, Ian Tyson designed that first program. It's right there. And the uh, poster apparently um, hung in his uh, kitchen uh, until he died fairly recently, you know, just this past year. Uh, he was very proud of his of his early connection with Mariposa. Uh, the performers, some of the performers were just hired. Others had to audition. And uh, two local guys, Really, yeah. Gordon Lightfoot and uh, his partner Terry Will, and they were uh, uh, they were playing as a, a duo at the time, and they auditioned, but they were turned down. If you can believe that, and uh, Gordon told me that he said we sounded uh, too much like the Everly Brothers, and they took that as a backhanded compliment because uh, it meant that they uh, they were very good at at harmonies for one thing, and uh, but they uh, they had to wait their turn to to appear at the festival. Uh, this is a picture from the very first uh, festival. Uh, there was a, a street dance on the Friday night, and that's a picture near the corner of Mississauga Street and um, and Peter Street in Aurelia. And it was all very peaceful, very calm, and uh, you know, no outrageous behavior, which uh, changed in a couple of years' time, as as you will see. Uh, the star attractions at the first festival were Ian and Sylvia. They, uh, along with the Travelers, were the best known acts uh, on the on the list. And uh, but every act was treated the same. Nobody was really called a headliner. No one was considered a star. Everybody was paid exactly the same amount. Which uh, I've seen the contracts, and uh, it was not a lot of money that they made for playing at the festival. Uh, the stage is kind of interesting. Uh, Dr. Jones had a fascination for, um, he had a fascination for uh, medieval pageantry. And he actually designed that first stage, did a little mock-up uh, model of it. And then you can see on the right, that's the actual stage. And uh, the first festival was held at the community center where the Lions Oval School is now. And uh, then there's a picture of Ian and Sylvia standing in front of that stage as well. Uh, the second year, the lineup was uh, almost exactly the same. They brought back the same people. 
they did include Oscar Brand, who was a TV star at the time. He had a TV show called Let's Sing Out. And then they added this guy as well. He finally got to play in 1962. Gordon by that time had split up with Terry and uh, he was on his own and just starting out. And uh, it wasn't his first time, uh, sorry, it was his first time to play the festival, but it certainly wasn't his last. So we get to 1963. Um, Aurelia at that time had about 15,000 people. It was a really peaceful little town. Uh, apparently there was a police force of about 15 local um, uh, town policemen, uh, about 10 OPP and four uh, RCMP. Those were the numbers that I was able to find anyway. Um, so they were not prepared for what happened uh, in the in August of that year when the festival came back to town. The first year, the festival brought in about 2,000 people. The second year, in 62, there were about 5,000, which was a pretty big crowd. And then by the time you got to 1963, it, it's estimated that there were about 20,000 people came to Aurelia for the folk festival. Well, some came for the festival, some came for the party. Um, uh, apparently, the um, the highway coming north from Toronto was was jammed. Uh, on the Friday night, the the restaurants and grocery stores sold out, and uh, but everything was peaceful. There was a campground for a lot of the visitors at uh, uh, at Severn Bridge, which is you know. 10, 12 miles north of Aurelia. And they had planned to have some kind of a some kind of partying there, but uh, that got out of hand out there. Uh, and with it, it could only accommodate a certain amount of people. So uh, lots of uh, the visitors just uh, threw up their tents in uh, uh, in, in Kuchijing Beach Park. And uh, I'm sure a lot used uh, Tuttup Park too, which at that time was called Barnfield Campground. Uh, Saturday night, uh, the concert was uh, jam packed at the Oval, uh, like right to the right to the fences, apparently, and not not even all the people could get in. The people who had some of the people who had even bought tickets couldn't get in. And what happened was after the the concerts were over at ten eleven o'clock at night, um, the crowd decided to head downtown, very short distance. They walked down and there are all kinds of stories about what happened. Um, some of them, I think, are apocryphal. Some are kind of made up. Some have been enhanced or, or misremembered. But uh, the police obviously just could not handle the crowds. It really at the time was a, a dry town. You were uh, not very restricted where you could uh, buy or sell or drink alcohol. And... Um, People were walking around with open beer cases, handing out beer out of the, the backs of their cars and so on. And police were arresting people, taking them to the uh, the police station, which is the uh, Aurelia Museum of Art and History now, uh, taking them down to the basement. There were three little cells down there. And apparently they would put people in for a few minutes and then rotate them out and put the next few people in. Um, there were stories of, uh, you know, the police being surrounded by crowds when they tried to stop people from from drinking or carrying cases of beer around. Uh, the crowd would swarm around the, the cops and the, the police were just powerless. Uh, there were stories about, you know, rolling beer bottles down the Mississauga Street Hill towards the lake. Um, I can't really imagine that that's true since, uh, you know, if there were so many people on the streets. But apparently all kinds of broken glass on um, on the side streets like Matchadash, for example, um, the a lot of the storefronts, you know, you know, really a lot of the storefronts are, are recessed. Uh, they were used as toilets, likewise with people's houses along the way. And then the part the crowd moved to uh, Kuchijing Beach Park. Uh, the, the statue of Samuel Le Champlain was um, uh, baptized with beer. Uh, there were stories of of thefts from cars and from buses at the uh, at the uh, <clears throat> excuse me at the park. Um, one of the things interesting about all this is there were a lot of arrests and a lot of uh, charges, but um, not one person from Aurelia was charged with any kind of uh, misdemeanor or, or crime. Uh, 
just a little bit of a, <clears throat> a personal, I have a couple of times where I'm going to switch over <laughs> to personal anecdotes. Uh, I was uh, very, very young at the time, but the day after the festival, I went down to the park with my cousin and we gathered, <clears throat> and I've, I've worked this out mathematically, 2,000 beer bottles because we both we made $40. Uh, and uh, I remember my dad coming around with, with the car. Uh, we, would, we would pick up boxes and boxes of, of beer bottles and he would take them to the beer store and then come back and we'd load up the car again. So um, that kind of tells you how much drinking was going on. Um, this is a quote from Alderman Pete McGarvey, not, not festival organizer Pete McGarvey. He said, it's obvious that we can't have another festival here. And it was uh, nationwide news that uh, there really had had this uh, so-called riot um, at the festival. Uh, it didn't deter the organizers, though, because the next year they planned another festival, again, beginning of August. And this time it was going to be out, in, uh, out near Moonstone. And... Um, the people at Moonstone were not too happy about it. The council there uh, uh, got a, uh, you know, uh, went to actually went to court to stop the organizers from setting up, and it wasn't settled until the actual day before the festival was supposed to start. So August sixth, the organizers got word, "Sorry, you can't set up your festival here at Moonstone." So really quickly and this this just amazes me as you know being part of the as being one of the people who helped organize the festival when it came back to Aurelia uh, they were able to transfer all their equipment um, all the performers um, work out accommodations and everything down to Toronto what they did was they rented Maple Leaf Stadium which was the the baseball stadium for the AAA Maple Leafs uh, down at the foot of Bathurst Street and um, that's where they held the festival in 1964. Uh, Buffy St. Marie was the big name that year, but Gordon Lightfoot got to play again. And this is a picture from 1964 of Gordon on stage with uh, blues legends, Reverend Gary Davis and Mississippi John Hurt. Um, Gordon told me he was just, uh, he was very nervous and, and very, um, very thrilled at the same time to be playing with, with such uh, musical legends. Um, a lady named Estelle Klein took over the programming in 1965, and Estelle is very well known in the folk music uh, business, festival business. Uh, she's the person who instigated um, having um, mini concerts during the day, you know, called workshops. And just about every folk festival, at least, and a lot of other festivals, too, have these kinds of workshops. Now, uh, what she would do is, is take, um, you know, several people several performers who uh, maybe they didn't even play the same type of music, but she would put them together under some kind of theme and they would all, um, they would all chip in and, and try to uh, play along with each other. And uh, it's been a very successful thing. I know for a lot of the people who still go to the festival, it's, uh, it's, it's more interesting for them than the actual main stage stage shows. So that's, one of the things about Estelle Klein was she started that. She's very, very influential in the history of Mariposa. Um, in 1965, Mariposa moved northwest of Toronto to a place called, uh, well, Caledon, but uh, a place called Innes Lake. But don't go looking for Innes Lake uh, on a map at all. The Innes Lake is just, it was the, the Innes family farm. And they had a little pond on it, so they colorfully called it Innes Lake. I like this picture because it, it sort of uh, reminds me of the pictures that we've all seen of Woodstock uh, a few years later in 1969. Uh, but uh, it stayed there for several years. Um, in 1965, an interesting thing happened. And this is my favorite picture of all the, the photos that I've gone through of thousands of photos of Mariposa. Uh, on the Saturday night, the power went out. And um, uh, the Mariposa organizers, uh, as usual, being, uh, being very good at uh, impromptu things, uh, turned several cars towards the stage, turned their lights on, and then someone stood beside the performer, in this case, uh, Phil Oakes, and uh, Phil uh, sang into the megaphone and, and finished the concert. Um, 
just kind of shows you we've had similar things happen later on with with rain and rainstorms so like i said it, for three years it, it played at innis lake and and again if you're of a certain age and you know folk music uh, if you look at some of those names it's uh you know these are these were big stars who stayed big stars uh, for many many years Um, Leonard Cohen and Joni Mitchell both played the festival at that time. Um, when I was talking to Gordon Lightfoot a few years ago, I, I said to him, Gordon, you know, you are our, our greatest uh, singer and songwriter. He said, oh, no, no, no. You'd have to talk about, you'd have to talk to Leonard and Joni about that. But uh, yeah, that's up for debate. Uh, like I said, Ian Tyson designed the first uh, Mariposa logo. Uh, Murray McLaughlin. Uh, who at that time was just a um, uh, a, a, a volunteer, uh, he changed it in 1967. And um, uh, it's still the same logo that Mariposa uses to this day. In 1968, uh, the festival moved to Toronto Island. Um, it was uh, closer to, you know, the, the big city and, and where, where most of the audience came from. Uh, it was a controlled access because you you could only get there by ferry, and it allowed the organizers to uh, you know they could uh, close off the island and, and it was a beautiful natural setting. It was very much like what Tutta Park Tutta Park is to to this day, um, treed, uh, lots of room to spread out so that uh, there wasn't sound bleed from one uh, one minor stage to the next and. Uh, uh, it's really where Mariposa made its big reputation. Uh, in 1969, Joan Baez was the headliner, and she um, th th that was a year that they uh, the CBC actually did a documentary about Mariposa, but um, it's very, very difficult to find. I, I was not able to find a copy of it when I was doing all my research uh, for Mariposa uh, for my book, and uh, I have found a copy since with CBC, but uh, it's a very rare thing. Very few people have seen it. Uh, Joni Mitchell loved the festival, and she said it was the place to be. So she convinced her then uh, briefly uh, boyfriend, uh, J uh, James Taylor, who was just starting out as a big star. James was making, well, <clears throat> let's say tens of thousands uh, a night. Um she convinced him to come to Mariposa and play in 1970, and his contract was for $200 for the weekend. But that was uh, kind of the influence that Estelle Klein, that Joni Mitchell had, and also the reputation that the festival was getting. Um, Estelle was, uh, she was also uh, uh, very instrumental in um, in diversifying the festival. She brought in uh, acts from Africa, from Europe. Uh, she made uh, sure that there was a strong indigenous presence. And um, we can credit her for doing a lot of that kind of uh, uh, multicultural stuff as well. In 1972, uh, I, I tell the story that uh, we got visits from folk royalty. Um, I was there that year. Again, still very, very young. Uh, but I went to see Murray McLaughlin, who was uh, who I, I was a big fan of Murray, and he got up. This was a Saturday afternoon, and he said, "Well, sorry, folks, I'm not going to be playing this afternoon." And there was a groan from the crowd because uh, you know we were all there to see Murray. He says, "My friend Joni Mitchell is here from Los Angeles," so Joni got up and she sang about five or six songs, and then she said, "Well, that's it for me." And again, everyone groaned, and she said. My friend Jackson Brown is here from Los Angeles. So Jackson Brown got up and sang. So it was, uh, we had some interesting visitors. Then the next day, uh, Bruce Coburn was slated for a concert about four o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, he stood up and said, uh, I'm giving up my concert today because Neil Young has dropped in. And Neil was just starting out as a solo artist at that time. And, and uh, again, it was a thrill for the audience. Uh, Bob Dylan showed up that weekend. He came to see a guy named Leon Redbone, who was a, a quirky, old-time, uh, mysterious figure. You couldn't, yeah, uh, you couldn't really count on when you were going to see or hear uh, Leon. So um, when Bob found he was going to be at Mariposa, 
he decided to fly all the way from New York to Toronto. And uh, he showed up and and uh, Gordon Lightfoot showed up as well, just dropping in to, um, to check out everything. Uh, I don't think it was planned that the two of them were going to be there together, but they, they did get together. Um, Gordon wandered around the site unannounced, and uh, at one point he gave an impromptu concert on a picnic table with the Good Brothers. So um, uh, a few lucky people got to hear uh, Gord with the Good Brothers uh, uh, unplugged. Uh, many years on the island were sellouts, and um, the festival really flourished. They they really had made a lot of money. They were able to hire staff. Um, they uh, they had an office in downtown Toronto, and um, it was good times for them. They started to put out records on on vinyl uh, of of the artists, and they also started to tape every performance. So you might have a performance where. Uh, John Prine, for example, would be playing with Steve Goodman and Bonnie Raitt and, uh, you know, something that would never, ever be um, repeated again. We have it on recording in the Mariposa archives, um, thanks to the foresight of people to tape those, those uh, workshops and concerts. Uh, other years, a few years, it rained. And the rain washed things out, ticket sales uh, suffered, and the finances of the, uh, of the organization uh, uh, suffered as well. Uh, so it was up and down, which has been the, the history of the, the festival. There was an actual Native Peoples area, like an entire part of one of the islands down, on, down the Toronto Island complex there. Uh, it was set up in the mid '70s. It had a a teepee, and you could go there to look at the uh, uh, indigenous crafts, uh, music, uh, storytelling, and uh, again, kind of showing, um, you know, acceptance uh, maybe ahead of its time. I think, uh, but folkies tend to be that way. Uh, Mariposa to this day has an area called folk play, which is uh, a children's area. Well, it was uh, it was really pioneered by Sharon Troston and and Lois Lillenstein, uh, two thirds of uh, Sharon Lois and Bram, and Bram, for that matter, had actually he had been a performer uh, back in the '60s at, at Mariposa when it was at uh, Innes Lake. So the three of them had a long history, and they were inducted into the Mariposa Hall of Fame a few years ago, rightly so. By about 1980, though, uh, the festival, it, they weren't selling as many tickets. It was scaled down. In fact, it was so scaled down in 1980 that it was just a fall festival, and they held it at Harborfront inside. Um, and it's a, there's a, there's a I, I consider it, a, it's a really unknown why that happened, why uh, it went from being so popular to, you know, really almost dwindling away to nothing. Um, I think part of it was changing musical tastes. You know, younger people wanted disco and punk music. Um, there was more competition for the entertainment dollar, that's for sure. Uh, you know, a lot more bars and and um, live venues and things like, uh, you know, the Blue Jays had, had been established by then. Uh, I'm not really sure. I don't really have an answer for that. My friends out in the West who were setting up folk festivals at that time, they say that, um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't either any one of those things because they were starting the Calgary Folk Festival and the Edmonton and Winnipeg Folk Festivals at that time. So uh, I'm not really sure the answer. But what it meant for Mariposa was that they were headed towards bankruptcy. Um, there had been some financial mismanagement. Um, there was uh, they had to fire people who were, were working for them just because there wasn't money to pay them. Uh, bad weather certainly hurt it. So that in 1981 and 1983, there were no festivals at all. And the one in 82 um, just was not very successful um, and didn't bring in enough money. And the the, the festival had worked up a, a huge, um, a huge deficit. They had a lot of, they owed a lot of money. And there was even a movement to cancel, uh, cancel the foundation. Uh, Estelle Klein actually was part of that group that wanted to just cancel Mariposa and say, you know, we had our day, let's end it. Thankfully, they didn't. Because, I like to say, 
Mariposa was saved by the beer. Um, the Molsons had set up a, a brewery in Barrie, right, just off of Highway 400. And they had a huge um, park just to the south of it. It's all big box stores now. But at that time, it was a beautiful park, which had enough room for camping and for all the things that we've come to know at Mariposa. Uh, and uh, they needed Mariposa, uh, sorry, um, Mariposa needed, needed some support. But uh, Molson's also wanted to have some kind of uh, event that would bring in people to uh, rent their facility and, most importantly, to drink their beer. So they, they actually offered to sponsor Mariposa for five years, and it was quite successful there. Uh, Tracy Chapman, Lyle Lovett, uh, Lorena, Lorena McKinnett, uh, they played there, Arlo Guthrie, uh, Joan Baez again. Jackson Brown again. Um, so we had quite a few big name people come to Mariposa at Barrie. That's a picture of uh, the folk play at Barrie. Then in 1990, um, it was a terrible weekend for the festival. It rained all weekend and the, I guess the week leading up to it. And I heard one story and I'm not, again, I'm not sure if this is actually true, but one of the people who volunteered at the time told me that they did not sell a single ticket at the gate because of, of the rain. And uh, at the same time, Molson's was deciding to go in a different direction. They wanted more, they wanted more say. They wanted to hire groups. Well, one story is that they wanted to hire a group called the, they, they wanted to hire the Moody Blues. And they said they would pay for everything, but uh, it didn't really fit in with the Mariposa folky vibe. Uh, there was a film shot that year, and you can actually watch it on YouTube. And it, it tells a bit of a story of the of the festival, but it also shows, you know, what it was like and and what a terrible weekend it was weather wise. So Mariposa had to be on the move again. Uh, in the early '90s, it moved back to Toronto, this time to Ontario Place in September. So you know, after the CNE was over and and most of the tourists were uh, were had gone home. Uh, Ontario Place was pretty much vacant, so they were able to use um, use the, the facilities there. And, and uh, I was never there myself personally, but uh, I heard that it was uh, a great venue. Again, they could spread out. There wasn't any uh, noise if you're at one stage and you didn't hear what was going on at, uh, at the stage nearby. Um, some of the uh, some of the posters from the early '90s. Um, uh, the Bare Naked Ladies were just starting out when they played Mariposa for the first time. Uh, apparently, they didn't even have a, a record deal at the time. They just had, uh, had cassettes. And uh, they came back you know, a few years later, and, and they were thrilled. And they remembered uh, being there so many years before. Now, one year at the festival, they held it in June. And um, talk about having bad luck. It actually snowed that weekend. It was so cold. One of the few times that it had ever snowed in Toronto in June. And uh, unfortunately, it happened the weekend of Mariposa. In the mid-90s, one year, 1996, they actually held two festivals, uh, one in Coburg, one in uh, Bracebridge. Uh, the one in Coburg, uh, it, it was kind of mismanaged. They, they gave away too many free tickets. And also, that very weekend, there used to be a, a, um, a ferry that ran from Rochester, New York, across the lake to Coburg. And there was a big drug bust on the, on the ferry that year. And the people in Coburg, uh, I guess some of the city councillors, uh, were just shocked. And, and they didn't want anything to do with these hippies and, and bringing their drugs into Coburg. So uh, it was cancelled in Coburg. Uh, Bracebridge, uh, they... They kept it going for uh, about three years up there, and they um, <clears throat> they had a beautiful site there, the uh, Annie Williams Park, a uh, nice sloping uh, area goes down to the to the lake. Um, but um, the the uh, the money wasn't really there for for the festival to hire big name acts that would draw draw crowds. So by 1999, uh, it was back to Toronto. But this time in Parkdale, which is in the, the western part of downtown Toronto, 
and uh, it was just a, a few afternoon concerts and, and not a very big uh, festival at all. So Mariposa was, uh, you know, on one of those very bottoming, bottoming out um, uh, spaces in, in its existence. So they were uh, looking to go elsewhere or to find some way to keep the festival alive or revive it. And thankfully, we had these three guys. I call them the three wise guys. Um, Tim Lauer and Don Evans were both counselors in Aurelia. And uh, Gord Ball was a, a musician and, and um, a, a folky. And the three of them had started to lobby Mariposa about coming back to, to uh, Aurelia. And uh, again, it was one of those things where, you know, Mariposa needed a place to go. Aurelia wanted to have them back. And um, it worked. The, the festival finally came back in 2000, thanks to these three guys and a lot of other people, too, of course. So against all odds, Mariposa came back to Aurelia in 2000. Um, people had long memories. There were a few people that thought, oh, no, we don't want these uh, rioters coming back to Aurelia. They, they remembered the 1963 uh, events, but uh, that was a, a very small voice at the time. Uh, the fact that Gordon Lightfoot was the Sunday night uh, headliner uh, assured success, um, and uh, Mariposa had, was back on the upward trend again. Um, it, uh, the uh, the money started to, co to come in and they were able to spend uh, spend a little more freely for a couple of years. And then they spent so freely that you know, they almost w went bankrupt again. I, I shouldn't say um, went bankrupt. They, they just went uh, went a little wild with the money and, and weren't as careful as they should have been, some of the organizers. Uh, during that time, uh, Steve Earle, uh, Bruce Coburn, Ian Tyson, David Francie, um, Gord Downey on it with his own solo uh, solo act, uh, Murray McLaughlin, they were some of the male performers, uh, the McGarrigal sisters, Serena Ryder got her start uh, at Mariposa, Natalie McMaster and Feist. So some fairly big names came in and the festival started to get a reputation as being you know, a good place to have fun. It didn't really matter what kind of music you liked. You were going to see and hear all kinds of things. Then in 2004, there was a little bit of drama. Um, a lot of people um, listening to this might remember that Gordon uh, nearly died in 2002 from an aneurysm that he had. Um, and uh, for a couple of years, it didn't look like he would ever perform again. I remember thinking that uh, we'll, we'll never get to hear him again. But then at the festival in 2004, all of a sudden this black limousine pulls in, out steps Gordon, his chauffeur pulls the guitar out of the back, and he asked if he could get up on stage, and he sang one song, which was uh, appropriately called uh, I'll Tag Along. Um, I was in the audience, and uh, probably a lot of your listeners, uh, the, you listeners are as well, um, you could hear a pin drop, uh, and it was such an emotional moment for people. In 2005, uh, the, the festival decided to honor people who had helped out, um, uh, either as volunteers or as entertainers. And uh, the, first, uh, the first people that were uh, honored were um, the builders, uh, Pete McGarvey and, and Ruth and so on. And uh, then the next year, we, um, we honored Ian and Sylvia and uh, actually got them back together. So that was quite an event. It was held down at Hughes Room in Toronto. So it was very small. You can only get about 200 people in that venue. But uh, uh, Gordon Lightfoot got up and, and uh, gave an eloquent speech about how, how great Ian and Sylvia were. And, and we got uh, testimonials from, uh, I got pe people like, uh, um, well, Leonard Cohen and Nancy Griffith and Tom Russell all sent uh, words of congratulations. Uh, it was very, uh, very nice event. Uh, the archives, like I said, um, they've been saving all of the uh, the tapes of the of the concerts and the workshops. Uh, Mariposa had all these uh, fabulous pictures from uh, festivals past. And it was all being held in a 
uh, an old police station in Parkdale. And uh, I was on the board of directors at the time. We went down to uh, Parkdale to look at the archives with an archivist from the Ontario government. And uh, she noted that there was a, a rusting sewer pipe directly above all of the, this stuff. And the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the archival material was was not being stored properly in the a lot of the cans of um, like a lot of the uh, the recordings were on tape real real tape and the tape was actually turning to water in the cans so uh, she said this stuff is worth millions of dollars but you need to get it to an archive uh, you know a, a proper um, a proper facility to look after it. So uh, we quickly made arrangements to take it to the uh, York University Clara Thomas archives in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, Bob Dylan, we think he showed up again, and there's kind of a, a mysterious story about that. Gordon Lightfoot and Dylan were both scheduled to play in Aurelia that weekend, believe it or not. Uh, Dylan was out at the, at the casino, Casino Rama. Uh, Lightfoot was on main stage, and um, I was the mu musical director at that time, the artistic director, and I, I phoned Bob Dylan's agent to say, you know, Bob and Gordon are, are good friends. They're both playing there. They'd probably like to see each other. And so I invited Dylan to come to the, to the festival. Uh, and uh, so that was the weekend, though, that on the Sunday night, just as Gordon was getting up on stage, the skies opened up. We had a terrible rain and, and thunder and lightning storm. And uh, uh, Gordon stayed up on the stage, uh, even though everyone was yelling at him to get off, you're going to get electrocuted. Uh, he stayed on. And I think the reason he was staying on, because he probably th maybe thought that, that Bob was going to show up. At that time at Tuttup Park, there was only one exit. And when the rain began, a lot of people decided, well, I guess I've had enough of the festival. I'm going to head out. So there's quite a crowd leaving the festival. At the same time, this white limousine, long white limousine from the direction of Rama pulled in. Uh, I guess they looked at the, the, all the cars leaving the park and they thought that the show was over. And they turned around and left and again went back towards uh, the, in the direction of Rama. So we think that Bob Dylan showed up it would have been a great story if he had shown up and played with with gordon or or at least maybe came up on stage or something i should mention about 1972 going back to 1972 the first time dylan was there um he actually asked to play at mariposa that year but uh the organizers uh denied denied him they said uh well we're afraid that you know people will come running from every uh every other part of the island and uh, we just won't be able to control the crowds and, and uh, who knows what could happen. So uh, twice Dylan showed up and twice he didn't get to play. Uh, we always hired local, we've always been hiring local acts uh, at Mariposa. So there are some of the ones, Ronnie Douglas, Steph Dunn, Alex, the folk band, the Fernwood Trio, uh, Run the Kittens, Lance Anderson. And there, there are a few others. I, I haven't mentioned them all there, but those are the ones I had pictures for. In 2010, it was the 50th anniversary, uh, Ruth came back. So that was sort of the then and now pictures of Ruth. Uh, Ian and Sylvia both showed up. Um, they got together to sing one song uh, at the end, uh, Four Strong Winds. And Sheila Rogers the, uh, the, was the main stage host that year. Sheila has a, a radio show on, on CBC. Uh, when, when they started to sing Four Strong Winds, uh, I looked at Sheila and the tears were just running down her face. And I'm sure that was true of a lot of people in the audience as well. Gordon showed up, of course. Murray McLaughlin. Oscar Brand. Oscar was 90 years old, but still, um, you know, still sharp as a tack and uh, very nice man. Brought with him uh, another folk legend. The the man stand, sitting there beside him is Josh White Jr. And uh, uh, the Whiteley brothers, uh, Ken and Chris, had played uh, Mariposa. They'd been at Mariposa since 1967 and came back. Um, 
Aurelia had, you know, by by 2010, Aurelia had really embraced Mariposa. Uh, the Streets Alive uh, Festival uh, that we've we've had every every year for the last I don't know how many years uh, really seemed to quite often pick Mariposa as the theme. And the year that of 2010, it was the the big guitars. And uh, other years, it's been the the hippie vans. And uh, it didn't, doesn't seem to matter what it is. Uh, the artists in town will quite often pick Mariposa. Uh, we have an unexpected visitor every year, nearly. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that's not going to happen anymore. But Gordon would often show up um, to uh, you know, sing one or two songs at the end, and it was always a thrill for the audience. Uh, it almost came to be an expected thing the last few years. Um, uh, I, I always used to have a Gordon Lightfoot workshop where I'd have different performers playing Lightfoot songs. And quite often Gordon would come and, and uh, listen, either listen in, and a few times he actually got up on stage and, and sang something as well. Um, recently we've had Jan Arden, Serena Ryder, uh, Peter Yarrow, uh, Arlo Guthrie, the Berenica Ladies. These are just some of the performers in the last few years. Blue Rodeo were a big hit last year, of course. Buffy St. Marie's been there a couple of times in the last couple of decades. She's still going strong. Uh, that's a picture of a, a workshop stage, in case you're not familiar with Mariposa and its, uh, and its format. Um, you can get... Well, you used to be able to get up, up and close. Uh, the bigger the crowds get at the festival, the uh, the harder it is to 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 see the performers up close. As you can see, the crowds have got massive. We have huge, um, huge uh, video screens at, at the sides and and in the middle. So it doesn't matter where you sit; you get a great view of the show, and you can see the enthusiasm in the crowd there. Uh, one thing that's notable is that. Um, the pictures that you saw from 1970 or so, they were very, um, uh, the crowd was very young in their, in their twenties, maybe a few in their thirties. When it first came back to Aurelia, it was people who were kind of gray haired or even blue haired in the audiences. But I think that's really changed in the last few years. Uh, it's got to be a, a younger crowd again. And, and that's good. That, that means that folk music is, is still popular and still popular with a, a younger demographic as well. That's a, a, a map of the festival showing uh, the dark green areas, the camping. Uh, camping has been a big boon to the festival as far as bringing in, um, you know, bringing in a, a crowd that stays there all weekend. Uh, I, I kind of equate, it's like Brigadoon. Um, the festival, the Tutta Park is, is a, you know, clean, uh, well-kept uh, little park in town. Uh, then for a week, uh, it undergoes a, a change. Uh, this little village pops up, and then within two two days, it's gone again. Um, when I was part of the organizing crew for the the festival, we used to have uh, a walk around with city officials uh, to check out the you know the park to see if there was anything that needed to be changed or anything that needed to be watched for safety, and uh, and then they. They, they do another walk about uh, two or three days after the festival. And after the festival, the, the city officials would often say to us, you leave the park better than you found it. So that's a credit to Mariposa and the organizers. There's what it looks like if you're up on stage, uh, you know, singing to the beer crowd, the beer tent. Uh, the food at Mariposa is always good. There's a uh, great variety. Um, you know, lineups for, uh, for for the food and great uh, testimonials from people when, when we ask for surveys at the end of the, the festival. Uh, the food is always a hit. Uh, there's an artisan village where you can buy, you know, all kinds of crafts, anything from guitars to guitar picks and, and uh, things that are not necessarily musical, you know, baskets and, and drums and so on. There's a, a view from the water showing uh, Westphalia Lane where all the, the uh, uh, Volkswagen uh, camper vans park. Um, and uh, 
it's it's a very peaceful, uh, beautiful setting. And uh, again, the people who come, they're they're peaceful. That they they are here for a good time, but they don't um, they don't destroy anything. They don't uh, uh, they don't cause any any damage. And they bring in uh, it's it's considered to be millions of dollars worth of value to the city of Aurelia every summer. Those are just some more of the acts that uh, people might be familiar with: Dave Gunning, Dalla, Matt Anderson. Uh, and that's my uh, my history of Mariposa. Uh, the book is available at uh, at the museum. Uh, I'm not sure whether Manticore has any books, any copies left. But uh, if you're interested, you can get. And, and that's not my reason for t doing this, but uh, that's just a <laughs> just something I, I have to say, right? Because I'm the author. So I'll turn it back to uh, Lindsay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, I'm sure many people in the crowd will have had an opportunity to attend Mariposa at some point in time. And um, you brought back a lot of memories. Um, so uh, as we mentioned at the start, if you have any questions you would like us to ask to Mike, you'll see the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And you're welcome to put your questions there and we will read them aloud so that you can hear what it is that uh, the question was that was asked. While people type, um, I will selfishly kick things off. Um, Mike, what is the most memorable Mariposa performance for you personally? Um, for me personally, I think it would be 2007. That was the first year I was the artistic director and uh, Don McLean, uh, the guy who sang American Pie, he came and he sang all his big hits. Uh, he was a very nice man, very friendly. Um, and uh, But I remember he had the entire crowd, main stage crowd up singing the song American Pie with him. And it was really, uh, you know, I kind of got choked up actually uh, at the time. Um, so that's, that's my favorite. But then any Gordon Lightfoot moment was good. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, okay, so we do have a couple of questions popping in here now. Um, so from Nancy, did Anne Murray ever perform? No, no. And um, by the time, at least, I mean, I'm not sure whether any artistic director before me tried to get her or not. Uh, she would have been a great fit. And Anne was a, she was a fantastic performer. I remember seeing her at, at uh, Casino Rama and, um, and she was just very down to earth and she would have fitted in with the Mariposa vibe perfectly. But uh, no, she never, ever did play at Mariposa. By the time I got to be artistic director, uh, she had retired. So um, I never got that chance. Uh, I almost hired her daughter one year. Her daughter was trying to break into uh, the business. And I thought, OK, if I if I hire the daughter, Maybe Anne will show up and they'll do a duo or a duet or something. And uh, but as it turned out, that wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> That's a little too cynical, a little too crass. <laughs> um, similar question: Did Rita McNeil ever perform at Mariposa? Yes, I, I believe so. I think in the the eighties she played at Mariposa. Um, I would have to look that up. Uh, I'm sorry. I do have I do have a list of all the performers, and I wanted to include it in my book, but the author or the uh, the publisher decided that that was too many pages to put in. Um, but Rita McNeil, you know, what a great uh, songwriter! Um, uh, she, the, the, in Sydney, Nova Scotia, they love her the way we love Gordon Lightfoot in Aurelia. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Rita would be again uh, same kind of down to earth person. She she'd have fit the vibe perfectly. Um, a question here from Jane. Is the foundation profitable now? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, Mariposa is back on um, on good financial grounds. Um, they had the foresight a few years ago. Um, well, I know uh, Ted Duncan, who's involved with uh, OMA. Ted was the president of Mariposa uh, for a while. And uh, Ted and a few other people were saying, you know, you've got to start saving some money for a rainy day and, and you know, set up some kind of rainy day fund. And uh, the board of directors over the years has been able to uh, put money aside and uh, 
now they're very secure. And now, uh, you know, the festival is back to the stage where it's it's selling out again every year. Like this year, it sold out really early, um, which is which is fantastic for the festival, money wise. Yeah. Disappointing for a few people who didn't get their tickets in time. <laughs> yeah. Um, question from Jerry and Bob. Did Stan or Garnet Rogers ever perform? Yes. Yes. Uh, Stan Rogers, and with Garnet backing him, played many times in the 1970s and even into the 80s before he he, he died in about 1982, 83. Um Yes, he played quite often, and then Garnet has played the festival uh, several times. I, I remember I hired I hired him maybe about twenty eleven or so to play the festival. Garnet never wanted to uh, play any stand songs, though. He always made that a um, uh, he, he made a point of saying uh, I do my own songs, and uh, but he he would play if it was a Stan Rogers um, tribute uh, or a, a you know a, a Stan Rogers themed. A workshop he would participate in those things okay um uh, another question here are any day passes still available this year that you know of uh i believe uh i believe i see the the sign at tutta park just about every day um i think there's still friday passes available but i'm not really sure the person asking that would have to call the office mm. in Aurelia. okay um, very cool question here. Can you think of a quote unquote unknown artist that you took a chance on and they exceeded your expectations? Yes, uh, Matt Anderson for 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 one. Uh, Matt Anderson, uh, I went to uh, like when you're an artistic director, you travel to uh, different conferences and uh, concerts and and things like that. And I went to Ottawa to a, a folk music conference. And it was about one o'clock in the morning. I was the only, just about the only person in the room. And Matt Anderson got up on stage and just blew me away with how, what a good guitarist he was. And uh, Matt is predominantly a a blues performer and I'm not a a blues fan in particular, but I just knew that this guy would, uh, you know, he was going to be great. People would love him and people would, um, you know, like, and and that he was headed for bigger and better things, and he certainly has has proven that. Uh, another group was the uh, the Good Lovelies. Um, they had just graduated from university, and they went to uh, the Folk Music Ontario conference in London. And what they what all the performers used to do was they would put their CDs into a big box. You know, one for Mariposa Folk Festival, one for Summer Folk, one for the Ottawa Folk Festival. And uh, I would listen to them on my way home. And I didn't even catch these girls at, uh, you know, live in London. But when I listened to their CD, I, I couldn't believe how good they were and how um, how amazing they were. So I hired them, uh, you know, sight unseen, basically, just based on their CD, which is not a good thing for an artistic director to do. But it worked out, and they have they have proven proven me to be correct. There are several stories I could tell like that. <laughs> I bet. Um, will you be attending Mariposa this year, Mike? Um, I hope so. <laughs> okay. Last question: Who is the act you are most excited to see this year? Um, well, I, I'm I'm old school uh, folky, so I think Judy Collins would be. I've never seen Judy Collins uh, live in concert, so uh, she'll be the one that I'd be looking forward to see the most. I think. Very cool. Well, um, folks, you can look for Mike at Mariposa and say hello and tell him how much you've enjoyed your your presentation this evening. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so we we have some comments as well coming in, just thanking you for your time this evening uh, as well, Mike. So uh, with that, I am going to wrap things up. Um, our, um, our history committee chair, Trish, could not be with us this evening, but she sent her uh, comments along to me. So I will wrap things up this evening. Uh, so on behalf of Trish, good evening. Thank you, Mike, for agreeing to be a guest speaker for this evening. Your topic is very timely uh, with the sold out Mariposa Folk Festival just a few weeks away and with the recent passing of Canadian musical legend and Aurelia's pride and joy, Gordon Lightfoot, who was a regular guest at this wonderful festival. 
Um, to all in attendance, thank you for your ongoing support of this speaker series. Note the History Committee will have a special tribute on social media on June 22nd uh, to a woman has, who has devoted most of her life to preserving our local history, has enriched the fabric of Aurelia, and contributed to the success of OMA. Uh, so you can check that out uh, in our eBlaster on Facebook. So uh, Trish says, as committee chair, I extend a special thank you this evening to the History Committee for their amazing work to present the annual speaker series, which acknowledges and celebrates Aurelia local history. We've been fortunate to have had so many amazing guest speakers join us this year. Um, thanks to Zoom, YouTube, and Rogers Channel 10, we have broadened our reach beyond Aurelia and area to out of province and even out of country, which is very exciting. We will have a summer hiatus over July and August, but we will return on September 20th um, with the poster you're seeing here, uh, Mariposa Arts Theatre 50 Years, pre presented by 30-year member of MAT, Chris Newton. Um, the Mariposa Arts Theatre Foundation turned 50 in 2020, um, and Matt has provided exciting and innovative theatre and film productions to our community. It has inspired and nurtured homegrown talent volunteers and audience members of all ages. And we're very much looking forward to Chris's presentation um, to celebrate our cultural history. Uh, it will also coincide with an exhibition at OMA, which we're very excited about. Be sure to register for that talk on the OMA website, or uh, you can give us a call at the museum as well, and we can help you with that. On behalf of OMA and the History Committee, have a happy, healthy, and safe summer, and we will see you in September. Thank you very much, Mike, again, and thank you so much to all of you for joining us. That's all for tonight, and have a great summer.